Last week we started looking at chickens and eggs and we, we, uh, feedback loops. Um, we looked at the uh, the crack in the rock uh, and the buttercup examples. We're trying to um, help you dry, uh, draw a uh, simple causal loop diagram. When I put it on the board, it seems unbelievably simple and obvious. When we start to try to create it ourselves, it's a little bit more difficult. I asked you to take the iceberg and turn it into a causal loop diagram. Today, we're at um, practicing using loopy thinking. Uh, this is on, the, on the, uh, the Blackboard page. We move from simple loops to loops that I'm going to ask you to try to figure out. The tipping point uh, suggests there's an idea of this butterfly effect. Anybody ever hear the butterfly effect? Almost 50 years back, an American mathematician and meteorologist named Edward Lorentz came up with a bizarre notion. A butterfly flapping its wings in Brazil can produce a tornado in Texas, aka the butterfly effect. The essence is that small causes can have large effects. This concept that was initially applied to weather has eventually found its place in economics, aerodynamics, chemistry, among other fields. In chaos theory, the butterfly effect is the sensitive dependency on initial conditions in which a small change at one place can result in large differences in a later state. The butterfly effect is a way of describing the cumulative effect over time of very small actions in large and complex systems. If, for example, a butterfly flaps its wings in one part of the world, that could be the cause for weather effects seen in completely different parts of the world. The, the, the metaphor is a, a butterfly flaps its wings, wings in South America, and through feedback loops and increasing snowballing effect, there's a, 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 a typhoon in China. You know, it, I mean, it's a metaphor, obviously. Um, it comes from a computer program on, from that, that, uh, on systems thinking, um, but it suggests that small changes have big, can have big effects. Not always, but they can have big effects depending on the context. If the dominoes are set up just properly, it only takes one push to, to, to knock them down. The, the, the key thing here is the dominoes have to be set up properly. The context in which we're working has to be <laughs> butterflyable uh, to, to tip it. And change is necessary. But we know change is necessary because we've got a system that's, uh, that's out of control. Um, the industrial uh, food system uh, creates pollution, soil erosion, you know, resource depletion, whether it be water, oil, um, phosphorus, fertilizers. Even if animals is a questionable part of this, this, this system, climate change, uh, disruption of rural communities, you know, and on and on and on and on. We know this is a problem with the industrial food system. It does one, two things really well. It produces lots of food and it produces rel relatively cheap and creates a, a significant degree of, wealth, degree of wealth for people who own large uh, bits of the planet, large parts of the resource base. Um, but they're off-site. Um, there are things that are not, not working well with it. And how can we... How can we take that system and make it work better? Our food is killing too many of us, according to the New York Times. So nutrition and, and how we eat are all part of this food system. That was a, a meal at the White House the uh, president uh, gave to somebody, uh, Sean. Off the, anyway. um, and we looked at we, and we looked at the foxes, you know, and their sad little dog, you know. And, and on Thursday, we said, or last week, we said, you know, is there a way out of the system? The, uh, the causal loop diagram here, you know, you buy feed from a processor uh, is part of a pattern of behavior where you're basically following instructions of the, of the, of the processor. Um, the structures that are part of that system are the chicken houses, the contracts, the loans, uh, and the mental model is driving that. Food should be cheap. Chickens are just units. They're not really living beings. Lots of other things around the system. But as long as we believe that food must be cheap and chickens don't need to be treated as, as beings, um, then this system makes a whole lot of sense. This system, taken to the extreme, causes um, nitrate pollution in the Chesapeake Bay. It causes um, uh, fish, uh, there's a fisteria, it's a disease of fish in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, it causes off-site problems, it causes small farmers to go out of business. There's lots of other effects. And the question is, is there a way out of this trap? And what I suggested last week was, not if you're in the trap. If you're in the trap, you're in a causal loop that, that prevents you from finding your way out unless you have independent wealth and you can, you can lose a lot of money. When you're in that system, it's really hard to find your way out. And some system larger than that subsystem must, must uh, recognize the problem and begin to um, correct the problem. 
And that's a symptom of a, of a larger problem, you know, a larger industrial lifestyle problem that suggests that, uh, that there are problems in the universe. In addition to having lots and lots of cheap food, we've got other problems that uh, are part of that industrial way of living. And can we find our way out of that trap? Well, I believe that we can. I believe yes, because something always happens. You know, there's something to learn thing happens. Uh, that there's a, there's a feedback loop when things get really out of control. Something to learn, we call that, that um, uh, something always happens. Something to learn happens. Pain comes from that. Willingness to change increases, and then the non standal action can be decreased. This is a causal loop diagram that, it, that expresses a, an opinion. It's not necessarily the world we live in. I believe it's descriptive of uh, some changes that I've seen in the universe in, in my lifetime. And boom, something to learn always happens. The bubonic plague was a bad time. Remember that? <laughs> you know, what was it the 1300s, 14th century? Half a European population dies, you know? What comes out of that? The end of the feudal system and a, a new kind of economy in which, because there's less people and there's lots of landscape, people found their way out of the landscape, created small business, created small farms, and created a capitalist society um, that allowed them more opportunity than they had in the feudal system. The bubonic plague was not a great time. Uh, it resulted in huge shifts in uh, how people interacted with each other uh, in, in, uh, in Europe. Change can happen fast. In my lifetime, there's been uh, civil rights uh, acts, civil rights legislation that um, ended um, discrimination in public schools, at least um, legal discrimination in public schools. In my lifetime, um, the, uh, the, the Berlin Wall came down. When I, when I was growing up, we used to get on this table and prepare for the Russians to be bombing us, you know, because the, the nuclear bomb was going to come any minute now, um, and we'd have to get under our tables, to, like that was going to do any good. Um, but, uh, you know, the Soviet Union unravels, you know. Cuba, which is, was part of the <coughs> Soviet Empire, um, changes. In uh, 1972, uh, there's the Clean Water Act, because the water is polluted, the air is polluted. Things have changed. 2015, we see the Supreme Court ruling for marriage equality. Things have changed over time. <coughs> and whether that will be a big change, we have yet, we, we yet to know. But there have been tipping points. Um, Rosa Parks becomes our classic standard example. Um, Rosa Parks was not just a person who decided not to uh, go to the back of the bus. She was trained by the Highlander Institute, which was a social change institute. She picked her moment in time and just like Gandhi had the New York Times following him as he walked across India to make uh, salt in the Indian Ocean. These were moments in time where the, the dominoes were lined up and one push made a huge difference. <coughs> anyone, ever read, anyone ever read the tipping point of Gladwell's book? Nothing Gladwell's a social scientist. He's become pretty popular and popularized a number of ideas, but his, his, um, his research, which he takes from other people and popularizes, I think it's pretty good. Uh, he suggests that there are things called the tipping point that where, where huge changes can happen in small amounts of time. And he, he, he based it, his book largely on commercial changes. Uh, his famous one was the hush puppy. I remember the, the, the shoes, the hush puppies, you know? When I was in junior high school, everyone had hush puppies. <coughs> excuse me. They disappeared. They disappeared until <coughs> excuse me. sometime in the mid 80s, mid the early 80s, um, when they came back. Malcolm documented how they came back. It was basically a group of uh, people uh, living in East Village in New York City um, that were kind of uh, oh, against the system kind of people. And um, they thought hush puppies was kind of a funny thing to, to wear. They started wearing them and it exploded because everyone wanted to be like the cool different people. So everybody became the same like the cool different people in the village uh, by wearing hush puppies. And, and this has been documented over time. Other tipping points. I have been described. And this is a little story about a couple of minutes. <laughs> Why do some books become bestsellers, but others don't? Why did it become cool for teenagers to smoke? And most importantly, why does one idea go viral and not others? Gladwell attempts to answer this with an idea he calls the tipping point. That magic moment when an idea, trend, or social behavior crosses a threshold, tips, and spreads like wildfire. The idea can be broken down into three principles. They are the law of the few, the stickiness factor, and the power of context. 
Let's take a look at these and see how they contribute to making things go viral. Lesson 1. The Law of the Few Gladwell identifies three types of people who seem to help epidemics grow quickly. They are connectors, mavens, and salespeople. Let's talk about connectors first. Connectors are those people who seem to know everyone. Everyone knows someone like this. They have more social connections than most people and are great at making friends. Mavens are the people that seem to know everything and always want to help. They are like that guy who was eager to show you how to make the perfect golf swing, or the lady who was excited to show you which skincare products are best and why. They enjoy helping you out simply because they love what they do. Lastly, we have salespeople. Why else would you end up with that tie that you never wear, or those computer gadgets you never use? These people know how to sell, and they love what they do. They let their actions do the talking, and they utilize the power of body language. The second lesson is the stickiness factor. The lesson of stickiness is the same. There is a simple way to package information that under the right circumstances can make it irresistible. All you have to do is find it. That song that sticks in your head or that thing a person has said that doesn't leave your mind. Gladwell talks about Sesame Street and how they increase children's attention rates by placing words behind the Muppets rather than next to them. Content did not change, just the placement. It's not always the major changes in how we present things that matter, but the small ones. Minor changes can produce massive results. What makes something sticky is different for everything and will always be a mystery. So what can we do? Although Gladwell doesn't hand us the answer on a silver platter, I believe the answer is to experiment. The final lesson is the power of context. Our environment affects our actions. Gladwell cites research that argues that if there are broken windows in a neighborhood, there will be a higher violent crime rate. People will walk by and conclude that no one is in charge. Soon, more windows will be broken and the sense of anarchy and carelessness will spread from the building to the whole street. So what makes a fad a fad and why do major changes in our society happen so dramatically and suddenly? Those questions are at the heart of a new book called The Tipping Point, How Little Things Make a Big Difference. It is the first book from Malcolm Gladwell of the New Yorker magazine, and I am pleased to have him back to talk about this book. Welcome back. Thank you. Great to see you. Yes. Uh, where did this idea come to you? Well, I, I was writing about uh, a couple years ago, I was covering um, the AIDS epidemic. Right. And I got very interested in the kind of internal dynamics of epidemics right. because they have a, their own sort of weird logic. And um, it just began to occur to me that I didn't understand why when we talk about contagious things, we confine our conversation to viruses or to, to diseases. Mm -hmm. Because the clearly... The phenomenon of disease could be attributed to other places, yeah, other well, ideas. But also, also, yes, exactly, that those same principles. I mean, so many different things are other things, ideas, trends, song lyrics, um, are contagious in precisely the same way. I mean, I talk in the book about the word yawn. If I say the word yawn long enough, you will start yawning. yawning and exactly. People watching a show will start yawning. That's an incredibly contagious word. Um, and it's contagious in precisely the same way as... Contagious as meaning everybody catches it? or Everyone's contagious? catching it. And right. it's a, I mean, it's, it's, it's right. spreading from one source um, everywhere. But there's the same thing is true for, I think, for particular for products or ideas or um, behaviors, especially. I talk in, in the book about all kinds of contagious behaviors. And, you know, that phenomenon has been really beautifully described and studied um, by a number of epidemiologists. And it's a, it's a really powerful... Uh, model, I think, for thinking about, it's one of several in the book, but for thinking about um, the spread of anything in a contained population. Okay, so what's the, what's the tipping point in that? Well, the tipping point is the word that comes from, uh, from um, study of epidemics. It's the, to describe that moment in the epidemic when uh, it explodes, when the moment of critical mass. Um, and if you look at every epidemic, there is always that moment when the curve suddenly shoots up very sharply and dramatically. And so understanding how you can get to the tipping point is really this um, 
is the critical question when you're looking at something that's contagious. How can I bring this... I think the critical question is what is the tipping point, but you don't think so. Yes, well, that's also... No, you're absolutely right. That's also critical because it differs from, from epidemic so to there, epidemic. You know, um, take some fads and show me mm -hmm. where the tipping point is or will be or likely to be. Um, well, uh, the, the word-of-mouth epidemics are something that... Um, I spend a lot of time on the, in the book. I mean, and the, the great sort of historical example that has a, um, where the tipping point is really obvious is, uh, is Paul Revere's Midnight Ride. Most famous word of mouth epidemic of all time. <laughs> yes. Um, the, the contagious message is the British are coming. Right. Um, the tipping point in that case is Paul Revere himself. And he's an example of what I call a tipping person. Um, because somebody else leaves Boston that night, William Dawes, um, with the same message. But no one, in all the towns William Dawes rode through, no one listened to him. And no one from those towns gathers the next morning to fight the British. But everybody that, um, that Paul Revere rides through, you know, their, their militias gather. What's the difference? The difference is that Paul Revere is this extraordinary individual. He's this unbelievably exceptional guy who, he's what I call in the book a connector. Um, he had the biggest Rolodex in colonial New England. He was on every member of every club in every society. Everybody knew him. He was incredibly gregarious. So when he goes to these towns, um, it's not simply him shouting out, the British are coming. It's him. It's people seeing it, yeah. that it's him. He has credibility. Yeah, right. He also knew who to tell because he knows everybody. He knows that if I'm riding through Waltham or whatever, or Needham, um, you know, Joe Smith is the guy who can get this all right. the way to, to the, you know. Um, so, if, so one if, individual. If Joe Smith, he knows if Joe Smith here, it'll be spread. Yes. Like even further. And, too. Yeah. Whereas William Dawes, you know, who knew William Dawes? I mean, so he rides through at 2 a.m. Yeah. shouting the British are coming. Who is this? So that's an example of how an individual can have, can serve as a kind of human tipping. So when Gladwell's book first came out, the social activist community grabbed this idea and said, how can we create our own tipping point to create the kind of social change that we want to see? Our context suggests that things often change. We have the willingness to change. We have enough pain and confusion and something to learn. Things get bad enough. Can you create a tipping point? Can you cause the butterfly to flap its wings and begin to change things? Well, Liz Christie did, Mr. Singh did in, in Rajasthan, and Rosa Parks did when she refused to get to the back of the bus. What we can do is continue to flap our wings and try to create change. Whether it happens or not, maybe out of our control, but we've got to continue to try.